So I'm learning that leading a church during social distancing is kind of like being at a college party. The judgment of everyone around you deteriorates the longer we're there. And people who think they can dance actually shouldn't be dancing. Well, welcome to Hope Church Online. I know we've already welcomed you here, but I'm so glad you're here. My name is Jason. I'm the lead pastor at Hope Church. And today we are in part two of the series called This Is Us. Uh, We are walking through the different relationship seasons that we go through. And in case you haven't uh, picked up on it yet today, we are talking about all the single ladies and all the single fellas. Uh, Today's message is about being single. Now, as we work through these seasons of relationship, uh, the reason why we're doing that now is because of what I said last week. You're probably in the same season you were in last month or three months ago, but our relationship seasons have hit new intensity. If you were raising kids and married uh, three months ago, you're probably in that same season. It's just grown in intensity. If you're single three months ago, you still are today, but it's grown in its intensity. And while every single week won't apply to the season of life that you're in, I believe every single part of this series is worth the price of your attention. And here's a couple of reasons why. Number one, it's either a season that lies in your future and you want to get it right when you get there, or it's a season that lies in your past. And every week we're going to see that every season was divinely ordained for a specific purpose in your life. And when you look at a season from your past, if you realize, you know what? I didn't use that season for its purpose. It's suddenly going to explain why you feel a little bit off course today. And the good news is if you discover how you got off course, you can get back on course. And so what we talk about today with being single, for example, might not apply to you if you're married, but it might expose some things that will help you get to a place to have a healthier marriage today. And the other reason why we're talking about this all these seasons is because no matter what season you're in, We need empathy for people who are in different seasons, and we need to be in prayer for each other. Last week, we looked at a story of a man who wasn't looking for a relationship, but he was fervent in prayer for a young couple, that they would come together and have a healthy relationship. And and we need that for one another. We need more understanding. We need more empathy, and we need more prayer. So as we approach singleness today, I understand that everyone's experience with being single isn't the same. Uh, For some of you who are or were single, it was a wonderful time. For some of you who are or were single, it's a terrible time. Uh, But there is an emotion or an idea or a feeling that you associate with being single. So the first question I have today is, what word do you associate with your single season? Uh, For some of you, uh, that word is loneliness. Or for some of you, that word is happiness. Or for some of you, the word is a brave heart yell, freedom! I don't know what that is for you, but Uh, whether you are single now or when you were single, what word or what idea or what emotion do you associate with that season of life? Tell us in the chat box. I want to hear from you uh, what impact being single has or had on you. Now, while you're telling us that in the chat box, I want to zoom way out from all of our relationship seasons for just a moment. And I want to give you a little bit of context for everything I'm going to be talking about in this series. In fact, it's, it's everything I plan on talking about for the next several months here at Hope Church. And what I explain, I hope, gives you some context to what you've been feeling lately as we've been under social distancing from one another. Um, I've been hearing lots of people say how they're feeling more anxious or more worried or or have really experienced a drop in self-control or self-discipline. People have told me that they feel listless uh, many hours of the day. Uh, Some people have told me that they're not really sure what time it is ever, or uh, there are some days where they don't know what day it is, and they're like, wait, is it the weekend or is it a weekday? And and we're not really sure. Um, And I want to explain and give you a tool to help you understand why we are where we are, why we're feeling this way, and how we got here. And to do that, I'm going to zoom way out and go back to the ancient world, at least the world before the time of the Dark Ages. In the ancient world, the nighttime was a dominant force in our lives. Uh, There were no artificial lights by which you could see, and because there were no street lights, house lights, headlights, um, when the sun went down, uh, that was basically the end of productivity for the day. Once the sun set, the day basically came to an end. Travel was dangerous at night because you couldn't see your surroundings. You couldn't see if danger was coming your way. You couldn't be as productive at night. And 
Imagine this, if you woke up in the ancient world and it's dark out, how do you know whether you should just get up or try and fall back asleep? You don't have a clock. You can't tell time. And in the middle of the night, if you're lying awake, there's no context and you feel very disoriented, not knowing when the dawn will come. So in ancient times, because at nighttime people couldn't be productive and it was a threatening time and there was so much unknown about it, uh, the reality is that historically night is a time of uncertainty in our lives. It's, it's a time when uh, we can't do our normal activities. Now, because there was a force that the ancients had no control over, the result was people followed and observed the natural rhythms of the day and the natural rhythms of the season. When the sun rose, people got up, they went to work, they got productive, and when the sun set, they shut off all their work and they got a full and restful night's sleep. And that was the way that God designed it to work. Because what God designed is that the nighttime is a time of healing. It's a time of renewal. It's a time of rejuvenation. Nighttime is a time when the cells in your body mend and they come back together. Nighttime is a time when your brain can process everything that happened during the day and get refreshed and recharged for a new day tomorrow. Nighttime is when your body re-strengthens and regathers its energy. And that was God's design. Night is a time of renewal. And in the ancient world and up to the time of the Dark Ages, people had no choice but to observe God's design and intention for the night. Because it was a time of uncertainty, it was also a time for renewal. But when Western civilization emerged from the Dark Ages, uh, moving into the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution and the modern era, we began to push back against the uncertainty that was associated with the nighttime. In 1820, Paris, France became the first city on earth to use gas lights to light their public streets. And that was our first pushback against the uncertainty of night. And suddenly people could go out at night and they were safer and they could move around and they could be productive and they weren't limited to daytime hours. Well, gas lights eventually gave way to electric lights and the gravity driven watches or clocks gave way to pocket watches and gear watches where people could wind them up and they could wake up in the night and they could see what time it was and see how much longer it was till dawn. Well, pocket watches gave way to digital watches, gave way to smart watches. And as you sleep today, uh, you have a device probably sitting on your bedside stand that if you wake up in the middle of the night, it can both tell you what time it is and serve as a flashlight to get you to the bathroom and back. Now that's pretty cool. But by the way, it also has access to all of the information and knowledge in the history of humanity. The bad news is it also comes along with all the opinions in the history of humanity. But either way, if we're pushing back against the restrictions and limitations that nighttime has always held over our ancestors. I mean, think about it. Today, you've got Times Square in the city that never sleeps. You've got the Las Vegas Strip. You've got a world in which the nighttime can impose no limits or restrictions on you anymore. We have pushed back against the uncertainty of it. And what we've done with the nighttime, we've done in every dimension of life. We've pushed back against the uncertainty of knowledge. We've pushed back against our uncertainty of physics. We've pushed back against the uncertainties of medicine. And we keep pushing that further and further back. But the results haven't always been good. While we've pushed back against the uncertainty of our world, we've also pushed back against the order of creation that God designed. And we've grown only more fatigued and more tired and more anxious and more disoriented, more exhausted. Because as we've pushed back against the uncertainty of night, we've also pushed back against the intended purpose of night, which is to renew us and rejuvenate us. But suddenly we find ourselves in a world where the uncertainty has pushed back against us. Suddenly we find ourselves in a world where the darkness of uncertainty has gathered over our cities and over the nations and over the people of our planet. And just like the nighttime is uncertain, we have entered a season of incredible uncertainty. 
We don't know when it will be safe to interact. We don't know when there might be a vaccine. We don't know when there might be treatments. We don't know what will happen with the economy. We don't know uh, what's going to happen in a month to say nothing of a year from now. We don't know. And we've been plunged into this season of tremendous uncertainty. You know, as I watch the news, and and I'm sure you do too, uh, you've probably heard politicians use a metaphor to try and describe what kind of season we're in. And the metaphor that I've heard politicians use is war. They say we're at war with the coronavirus. We're, We're at war with an invisible enemy. Now, that might be a helpful metaphor if you're a leader of a, of a national government or, or even a local government. Maybe that's the mentality you have to assume. But I, for the rest of us, I don't think that's the best metaphor to use to really understand how to make sense of the world we live in today. I think it makes more sense to understand our present reality as a season of night. And all the uncertainties that came to our ancestors in the season of night. And we're stumbling about in an uncertain environment, not knowing what's going on around us and not knowing what to expect next. Now, the reason why I think this is an appropriate metaphor to use for our current reality is there will be a dawn. There will be an ending to all of this. There will be a time in the future when we will have clarity, when we will have answers, when we will have certainty. And when dawn finally breaks and we are on the other side of this, the reality is the world will look different. And I don't know how it'll look different, but it will look different. Maybe politics will look different. Maybe the economy will look different. Maybe healthcare will look different. I don't know. But we're going to see a new world around us. But like someone lying awake in the middle of a night without a clock and without a watch, we don't know how long it's going to be until the dawn breaks. We're in a season of night and all the uncertainty that comes along with it. Over the past month, I've been reading through the book of Psalms on my own. And I've seen a few Psalms that have really helped me uh, see where we're at in our world and how to respond to the world that we live in. Uh, Psalm uh, 130 is one that I find particularly helpful. Psalm 130 says, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word, I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. See, this is a good place to camp out right now. This is a good posture to assume when we are in the uncertainty of night, like like these ancient watchmen standing on the wall without timekeeping devices, wondering when morning will dawn. That's where we live right now. And the best thing we can do is to wait on the Lord and to put our hope in His Word and His promises and His truth. Because we're at nighttime right now, waiting for the dawn to come. So here's the question that I want you guys to consider. While night is a time of uncertainty, God has also ordained the nighttime as a time of renewal, as a time of recovery, as a time of rejuvenation. So the question is, will you let God in this season, will you let him renew you? Will you let him rejuvenate you? Will you let him mend you and heal you during this season of night. Because I can think of nothing worse for you than for dawn to break on the other side of this. And we emerge on the other side of this and all of this is behind us. But you're the same person. You haven't become more resilient. You haven't become more wise. You haven't become more patient. You haven't become more loving. See, this is a moment where God has our attention and he wants to do something inside of us. He wants to do an inner work inside of you and he wants to strengthen you. He doesn't want you to self-medicate your way through this season, hoping that dawn comes soon. He wants you to look to him and put your hope in his word during this season. And nothing in our environment is going to help you do this, by the way. All of our attention is focused on the news and on the stories and on the coronavirus and all the bad things that are happening. 
You have to decide, I am not going to treat this season as a season to do nothing but worry about things I cannot control, but I am going to wait on the Lord and put my hope in His Word and His promises and walk in obedience to Him so that when the dawn finally breaks on us in the morning, I will be a renewed and a rejuvenated person. Now, I don't know when dawn's going to break. Nobody knows when the dawn will break. But I imagine that when it finally does, that's going to be a pretty good Sunday in church. Now, now I don't mean the day when uh, some restrictions are released and we can have up to 50 people gather together and we have to keep six feet apart and wear masks and gloves and, and stay away and no hugs. And In fact, don't even look at each other because that's dangerous. I don't mean that day. I mean the day when everything is back and the dawn has broken and you are not afraid to hug every single person you meet, unless you're an introvert like me, then this isn't so bad. But when you are fearlessly coming out on the other side of this and everything goes back and we can gather together again, I want to look you in the eye on that day and see that you are a different person that you're a stronger person, that you're a renewed person. I think that can be the best use of this season of night. Did you know that uh, Psalm 19 uh, talks about how God will often show up and rescue us when everything around us seems dark? Look at what Psalm 19 says. It says, In my distress I called to the Lord. When things are bad, when things are distressful, call to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. He parted the heavens and came down. And look at how he came down. Dark clouds were under his feet. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him, the dark rain clouds of the sky. Sometimes when God shows up to rescue you, he's enveloped in dark clouds. And I think that's what's happening here. So we can all run around like, Chickens with our heads cut off, reacting to every news story, reacting to every political speech, reacting to everything the stock market does, or we can be people who wait on the Lord through this season of night, waiting for the darkness to come, asking God to do an inner work inside of us. That we will not be people who rage against the night and complain about the night, but that when we will let God renew us so we can wake up and move forward in the dawn, as a stronger person. Now, here's a question I have for you. Does this make sense? Does this resonate with you? Does this help you understand where God has placed us in history? If that makes sense, put it in the chat box. Say, yes, that makes sense. Yes, that resonates. Or you can say, I'm more confused now than ever because this is the context I'm operating from. This is the metaphor I'm thinking about when I'm looking at the world we live in and everything I'm going to be preaching on, not just in this series, but for the next several months is going to be out of this metaphor and understanding that this is a time God has given us to be renewed and strengthened people. And in this series, we're looking at how to be a renewed and stronger person inside of your relationships because that's a place where we're feeling some pain points perhaps as our relationship seasons have grown in intensity. And today we're talking about what this looks like in the single season. Now, if, if, if you're single right now, and especially if you are single and living alone right now, you are carrying an extraordinary burden. Because we weren't made to live alone. Solitary isolation is a punishment. God made us to live in community. In the best of times, being single can make you feel lonely or or unwanted or question your worth as a human being. And after a while, it gets to you. Even if, if you're a person who's single by choice, if you have chosen to be single and everyone just kind of assumes you're supposed to be with someone, after a while, it can make you question your, your own judgment. And if you're single and you don't want to be single, if you're single and you want to be married, uh, that can leave you with feelings that question your self-worth or your very identity. Now, uh, since we're a church that's located in the suburbs, uh, it's not uncommon that I talk about 
uh, marriages and healthier marriages and even raising kids. And because of that, uh, all of us might be a little bit surprised to learn that the biblical authors had a very high view of being single. They had an extraordinary view. They elevated, in fact, the lifestyle of being a single person. Uh, today we're going to be in a book of the Bible called 1 Corinthians chapter 7, which was written by a single man, uh, Paul the Apostle, who, after Jesus was uh, the most influential person in the history of Christianity, spent his life as a bachelor, as a single man, and no one would say, well, I don't know if his life was well lived, or I don't know if his life was productive. He did an incredible amount in the history of the world. And in this chapter of 1 Corinthians, he talks about all kinds of relationships, and he talks about being single. And as he does, I want you to see how he describes what it means to be single. And this is going to surprise some of us. 1 Corinthians 7, 7. Paul wrote, I wish, I mean, if, if, if I, uh, on my birthday or when I throw a quarter into the fountain, he says, I wish that all of you were as I am. And he's talking about his relationship status. He says, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. So what Paul is saying here is, the fact that I'm single, that's a gift that God gave me. Now, have you ever received a gift that you just did not want? Maybe you got the fruitcake for Christmas or someone gave you the gift of getting in early in the multi-level marketing business. Um, you've probably at some point opened a present and you looked inside and there was a gift inside and you thought to yourself, if the thought that counts, I don't think this gift even counts because that's a terrible thought. Why would you get me this gift? You have all received gifts that you never wanted. Here's a dieting book for you. Didn't want that gift. What Paul is saying is you have received, if you're single, you have received a gift from God. And many of us who are single think to ourselves, that's not a gift I wanted. That's a terrible gift. Have you even heard what I pray about God? Have you even heard what I'm asking you for? Have you seen how much time I spend on the dating app swiping away looking for someone because this is not a gift that I wanted? How is it that Paul could call being single a gift when some people who are single don't want that gift? He explains why he can call it that in verse 35. He said, I am saying this for your own good. Not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way, dot, dot, dot. Now, in the next words, I'm going to show them to you in a few minutes. In the next words, he explains why being single is a gift. But we have to follow his line of, of argument here. He says, but I want you to live in a right way. Before you understand the reason, he says, you have to understand the right way to live. Now, this, this word, this idea, right way, he's talking about appropriateness or what's fitting Given the, con given the context that you live in. Uh, for example, there are some things that are fine until they're put in the wrong context, then they're no longer fine. So uh, let's say you wear a swimsuit. That's fine if you're at the beach. That's the right way to dress at a beach. But if you're going to a wedding, that's the wrong thing to wear. It's not fitting at a wedding. Or there are some things that I can say to my wife, Kathy, that can compliment her. And because I'm her husband, that's good. It's life-giving. That's the right way to talk to my wife. But, but if one of you guys were to say the same things to my wife, then we would have to fight. It's not fitting for you to say those things to my wife. Those, it's only right that I say those things to my wife. Now, Paul, in this chapter, has explained what the context is in which we live what the context is that makes us even able to understand why being single could possibly be a gift. Here's what he explains, verse 29. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not, those who mourn as if they did not, those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of this world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. Now here's what Paul is saying. He's not saying, okay, everyone, uh, go out, quit your jobs, divorce your spouse, and just party until we all die. That's not at all what he's saying. What he's saying is, while these things are important, the things of this world 
are important. Buying and selling things is important. Your relationships are important. They're not the main thing of importance in your life. In fact, if, if you read the entire Bible, and I highly recommend you do, if you say, well, what does it say about relationships? I don't know, less than 5% of the Bible is dedicated to relationships because that's not the main point of life. and It's not the main point of the Bible. The main point of the Bible, the main story of the Bible is the story of Jesus. It's the eternal story of how God from eternity past decided how he would save the world he created and loved. So Jesus entered this world and lived the life you couldn't live, a sinless, holy, and blameless life. But then he traded places. He died the death you deserve to die. And then he brings you that knowledge of what he's done and invites you to trust in him and believe in him and gain everlasting life, which is an everlasting relationship so that you can live forever beyond this life with him in heaven. That's the main story. And if you miss the main story, Paul says, then what did any of it matter? Answer, none of it. If if you miss the main story of life and how our little itty bitty stories intersect and are woven into the great big story of God, then all of it was forfeit. All of it was a waste. The only way any of this can have redeeming value is if you become a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ and you live forever with him. See, God has taken us out of the chaos of the kingdom of this world so we can live in the kingdom of Jesus with him. And that's the main story. And Paul is saying, if you read the entire Bible, there's only one event we're still waiting for to happen in the story, and that is for Jesus to come back. In other words, he says, you're in the fourth quarter, and that should influence how you view the things of this life. Uh, the first time I played uh, Madden football, um, it was in college, and it was in my friend's dorm room, and I'd never played before, and he owned the console. So I sat down next to him and started playing, and he is just shredding me. I was so bad at the game. He's destroying me. Well, finally, I learned, uh, and because um, I just wasn't very good at it, if I hand the ball off to my fullback, he'll smash forward for five yards. And I said, hey, that worked. I'll do that again. Smash forward for five yards, a first down. I'm like, hey, I have a new strategy. Hand it off again, five yards, hand it off again, first down. Now I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm marching down the field, and all of a sudden, the game stops. And I said, what happened? What's wrong with the game, man? And he said, you are an idiot. I said, what? Why why am I an idiot? He said, it was the fourth quarter. You should have been throwing Hail Marys into the end zone, not giving the ball to your fullback to to hand it off to him. You are an idiot. I said, number one, watch the language. And number two, I didn't know that. I've never played before. I didn't know it was the fourth quarter. And he said, that's what makes you an idiot. Now, that's what Paul is saying about the context of our lives. We are living at the end. We are living in the fourth quarter. And that should shape your view of all your relationships. Now, with that in mind, I want to go back to verse 35 where he explains why it's a gift. He said, I'm not saying I'm saying this, I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way, an appropriate way, given the context of where we live, in undivided devotion to the Lord. In undivided devotion. That's why Paul says being single is a gift and that's the purpose of being single. Whether you're single for a short amount of time or a long amount of time, Paul says if you want to be happy as a single person, here's what you need to know. The purpose of your single season is undivided devotion. The whole reason why God ordained a season of your life that everyone experiences for some amount of time The reason why God ordained this season of life is that you could have undivided devotion to the Lord during this season of life. Not fill it with distractions, not fill it with career ambitions, but to have undivided, undistracted devotion to him. But some of you say, Jason, you don't understand. I wish I could have that kind of distraction in in, in my life. I want someone to be with. I, I don't want to just have undivided devotion to the Lord. Besides, I have married friends and they seem devoted to the Lord. Why is Paul saying this? Well, he he explains. 
that married people can't have undivided devotion to the Lord the same way a single person can. He says, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. Now, clearly in context, he's talking about Christian men because he talks to his brothers and his sisters. He's talking about the church. And he says, if you are a Christian who follows Jesus and you are single, your only concern in life is how do I please the Lord? How do I live in a path that honors him? How do I do the most good loving God and loving my neighbor as myself? But he said, as soon as you put a ring on it, your interests become divided. See, here, here's, here's what I mean. Because some of you men you hear who are single, you hear about um, having divided interests, and you think, that's exactly what I want, though. I want my interests divided. I want to have a wife to please. So, so let me explain it, what Paul is saying this way. If you're single right now, man, when you get home from work, you can sit back on the couch, and you can let the Netflix wash over you. And it feels so good to do that. Now, those days are gone if you get married. Now, I did a pretty good job of picking a wife, if I do say so myself. I have never met a woman who, who is lower maintenance than Kathy, who is kinder, uh, who is more like Rebecca, who we talked about last week, uh, than my wife, Kathy. She is a wonderful woman. And if I could go back in time to my early 20s and meet her again and marry her again, I would make the same decision again, okay? So take it in that light. After I became a married man, I found myself doing things I never planned on or wanted to do. I found myself spending hours after our engagement in stores like Bed Bath & Beyond holding up plates saying, you like this plate or this one? This one or this one? This one or this one? Okay, now let's look at the silverware. And there's all these different options. And she looks at me and she says, it's like you don't even care about what we're picking. And I said, it's not that I don't care. It's, it's that I can't. I'm trying. I'm trying. I can't find it. I'm trying to care. I just can't get there. Guys, you're going to get home from work and you are going to think you can grab a beer after you get married and grab your controller and start playing video games. And she's going to sit down with you and want to talk. And she's going to ask you how your day was. And fine, isn't going to cut it. She is going to want to hear the details of your day. And then she's going to want to tell you all about the details of her day. And you're going to have to listen to her with your face. And you are going to have to go there. And you are going to have to care. And you're going to say, wow, that does sound really exhausting. I, I don't know how I would feel in that kind of place. And you are going to have to do that every day for the rest of your life until you die okay have you ever seen a married man and wondered why he looks so tired okay that that's why our testosterone starts dropping and our hair starts falling out after we get married according to what the science tells us it's because his interests are divided now, that doesn't mean marriage is bad paul is just telling you the reality of getting married and some of you ladies say the bible is so chauvinistic i can't believe it talks this way about what it means to be married to a woman Paul is egalitarian. Look at what he says next. Verse 34. An unmarried woman or a virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. See, some of you ladies, you're, you're going to get married and he's going to expect you to do the things that his mom did. He's going to expect you to clean for him. He's going to expect you to cook for him. And you're going to say, oh no, that's not how we do it. We are going to do this together. And then some of you ladies, you're going to marry a man whose level of cleanliness and, and hygiene, and hygiene it, it's not safe, okay? It, it, it's beyond bad. It's just no one should live like this. That's a dangerous way to live. And you are going to have to find ways to please your husband. Husbands, you're going to find ways to please your wives. And as a result, our attention is divided. Our attention is split. Now, again, marriage is a gift. My marriage is a gift. I would make that call again, and it's good. But I also remember when I was single, and that was also a gift. And it was a really good season of life. And what Paul is saying is if you are single, your singleness is a gift that your Father in heaven has given to you because he loves you. 
And he gave it to you for a specific purpose. And if you don't understand the purpose, you will never be happy as a single person. And the purpose is to have an undivided devotion to the Lord. And what you have as a single person is you have freedom and you have time. You have freedom and you have time. A few years ago, someone who was single came up to me and said, Hey, Jason, have you watched this show yet? It's like, nope. Have you watched this show yet? Nope. Have you watched this show yet? Nope. How can you miss all these shows? Like, I'm married. I have three kids. I have about 25 minutes of discretionary time a day. He's like, wow, I have about five hours. I'm like, I know. Why do you think I look so tired? It's because when you're married, you have a divided attention that single people don't have. And God gives you this season that you might pursue Him with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your strength and all of your mind. So the question is, if you're single, does that define your singleness? Or if you're married now, did that define your season of singleness? I I imagine that that many of us would say no. But, But Paul says if it's no, you're missing the entire point of your single season. It doesn't mean don't have recreation. It doesn't mean don't have fun. It means you have been given a gift of a position to seek the Lord with an undivided attention. And you can have an impact with your life that married people are not able to have. By the way, you can get involved with ministry. You can get involved with caring. You can get involved in loving your neighbor as yourself. You know, one time Jesus said something really interesting on this whole topic in Matthew chapter 19. He said, for there are eunuchs who are born that way, and by eunuchs, that's someone who, for physical reasons, can't have children. And there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, which is incredibly unfortunate, and we're not going to go into that. And there are those who choose to live like eunuchs. They're not eunuchs. But they choose to live like that. They choose to be single for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus said, the one who can accept this should accept it. That there are people who choose to be single for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus said, that's an admirable and noble way to live. It's the way that Jesus lived. Who lived and died as a single man. Who lived and died in undistracted devotion to doing the will of his Father in heaven. And he did that for you. To be redeemed. So, that's the purpose of the single season. So, in, in my closing moments here, I want to describe how to thrive in your single season. Okay, how to thrive in the single season. First point is this: establish your identity. And our primary source of identity is not to be in your relationship status, and it is not to be in by your income level or your level of education. It is to be rooted in God himself, and to establish your identity as a child of God. Not to make you a person who will have a healthier marriage in the future. God never promised you'll have a marriage in the future. Except what Jesus talked about is the wedding supper of the Lamb. That's what he promised for your future, eternal life in heaven. And the reason why you want to establish your identity as a child of God is so that whether or not you are single, or dating, or engaged, or married, You are a whole person and you feel like you are lacking nothing because redeemed children of God lack nothing. If the Lord is your shepherd, there is nothing that you lack. And the more you establish your identity as a child of God, the more confident you are in that, the more you pursue an undivided devotion to the Lord, the happier you're going to be and the more confident you're going to be in this season of life. Jesus has made you a whole person. So pursue him. Second, this deals with the reality of being seasoned. Address your loneliness. As a pastor, I have seen people make terrible decisions because of loneliness. The loneliness is understandable. So do whatever you can to fight back against the loneliness. Um, You have to intentionalize it more than a married person like me does. And that's just the reality of it. So intentionalize lots of friendships, non-dating friendships with people, with couples, with families, Uh, be around meaningful relationships that 
don't even have the potential to become romantic, uh, seek them out in groups, seek them out in church, seek them out in your community. Have relationships because you need to address your loneliness. And last thing is this, pursue devotion to the Lord. That's why God gave you the gift of a single season. Is it okay to pursue marriage if you're single? Absolutely. God said that's also a good way to live, but it's not going to complete who you are. Let Jesus do that. Before I wrap up in prayer, I want to tell you about a couple of next steps that you can take. Uh, For those of you who are new to Hope Church and you'd like to meet me and uh, maybe talk a little bit about this message, go deeper in it, or just hear about Hope Church, I want to make sure you come to the after party. Uh, following our service. We're going to take about 20 minutes. We're going to jump into a group chat online and uh, you can check out Hope Church. You can ask me questions that you want, uh, but you have to say, click on the link in the chat box and that's where you can uh, register and you'll get sent that invitation. We're going to start as soon as the service is over today and I would love to meet you there and uh, hear a little bit about your story. Uh, Finally, uh, don't forget Kids Connect Live is at 11.30 a.m. this morning. So if you have kids in elementary school, fourth grade and under, uh, make sure you're watching either on YouTube or Facebook Live our Kids Connect Live environment. Next week, we're going to talk about dating. But for now, let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, in your wisdom and your providence, you decided that all of us will be single for a certain number of years in our lives. Help us to see this season the way you see it. It's a gift you give, and your gifts are always good. Yet we don't always handle your gifts in the right way or the appropriate way. So I ask that all of us would see that to be single is to have a unique opportunity to seek undivided devotion to you. I ask that we will uh, have the wisdom to live out this season in a way that honors you and is a blessing for us. In Jesus' name.